Okay, let's move on from last week. L last week you had a bit of a treat because I went over old ground. Okay, so hopefully that, that was relatively comfortable. Uh, we're not really going to stretch the boundaries this week. We're just going to explore a little bit more about um, how we use these frequency response plots and what, what information can we get from them. Okay. I think you've all now been through a round of the tutorials and, and what we spoke about last week. So you know that we can investigate a real system and come up with a transfer function by looking at its frequency response. Similarly, we can, from a transfer function, go to a frequency response plot so we can infer performance. Uh, so what I thought we'd do today is we look a little bit more about that, but also to look into a thing that we can do with frequency response testing that allows us to predict behaviour. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on to that. Quick recap why we use frequency response. I think I just did that without realising it. Bit more detail on second order systems and interpreting the information from both plots and from Nyquist diagrams. And the key thing, the new thing I think we need to really focus on is, is looking at stability and what I'm calling performance margins. Okay, we'll get onto that after we've, we've done the quick recap. Okay, this is just a recap from last time. We, we know how to generate bold plots now. We've all probably had a go with the bits of graph paper and things in the tutorials. Um, and we also know that because of the, the way that the bold plot is formed, with logarithmic axes realistically both directions, because a decibel is a logarithmic thing, we end up with plots where we can apply asymptotic or straight line approximations. Okay, and that makes it really easy to interpret what's going on. So, let's take a closer look. There's a first order system plot. This is generated by MATLAB because it makes nice pretty graphs for putting into the PowerPoint. You can use MATLAB if you like. Uh, okay, there's the transfer function. What is that? Well, it's a first order system, but it has some gain associated with it. Okay, it just doesn't correspond to the 1 over 1 plus tor s standard form because there's a 2 at the top. So there's a gain of 2 and a first order system 1 over 1 plus 0.1s. 0.1 is the time constant and that means that the corner frequency, which should be 1 over the time constant, should be about 10 radians per second. Thankfully, if you imagine pulling straight lines to this, it should work. Let's have a look. There are my asymptotic approximations. Okay, the amplitude ones, as we discussed last week, they're always at particular gradients. They're always at particular slopes. Minus 20 down here and flat at the top. Minus 20 decibels per decade. Okay, you can see the point of intersection of those two is thankfully just where I expect it to be at 10 radians per second. Okay, so that fits in with what I'd expect. I've done the same for the phase plot, but certainly the ones I, the, those of you that I spoke to in the tutorial, phase plots, because they take much longer to happen, they take two decades of frequency to happen, they're a little bit less easy to deal with. So the amplitude plot we'd focus on first, then look at the phase plots, really just to confirm what's going on. Key features, at the corner frequency, this is halfway through the phase change. Okay. Starts off at zero. First order lag goes to minus 90 degrees. And what you notice is that halfway through, at minus 45, we're on that corner frequency. Fairly standard first order boat plot. Bit of additional information there. As just said, that the phase change takes two decades of frequency to happen. And if you look closely at the corner, what you find is that the real data at the corner frequency is three decibels down from the asymptotes. Okay? And that's always the case. And that is that the maximum error between the straight lines 
on the real data is three decibels, minus three decibels. <clears throat> okay, so why did I go through that? Because you knew that from last week. Well, the reason really is to lead into what the second order systems look like. Because we, we've got more of a problem with second order systems when we apply the straight line as, um, approximations. What we're looking at here is the same second order system but with varying damping ratio, varying zeta. Okay? The, the omega n, the corner frequency, I've kept the same but by changing zeta you can see what happens to the curves. Okay? If you look at the one in the middle, it's easiest to deal with, zeta equals 1. <clears throat> and that looks a lot like a first order one. It's nice, well behaved, no problem. Okay. And in fact, if you look at the zeta equals one phase, it takes about two decades to happen, much like the first order ones. Now, I, I could get a bit more mathematical at this stage and say, well, if you choose a second order system with zeta equals one, then you take that Transferring. If you factorise it, what you get is two equal factors. So it's almost like having two first order ones in the same place when zeta equals one. Okay. You can try that. If you, if you just pick some numbers to put into a transfer function with zeta equals one and factorise it, you'll get two equal roots. Okay. So zeta equals one, nice and well behaved. It's a bit like having two first order ones in exactly the same place. As a consequence, if we were to measure that, you'd find at the corner, the zeta equals one curve is six decibels down from the asymptotes. Okay? Two first order ones on top of each other. You can th see that things get different as we change zeta. The green one is a very lightly damped system. We've got zeta of 0.1. Okay. And what you get there is a peak on the amplitude response. Okay. We've got any third year mechanicals in here? Yeah, I feel you're owning up. You've been through level two dynamics with Vince, topped up by me after Christmas. So you know about things like this you know about these kind of graphs albeit in a different context okay how would you describe what you're seeing with that with that peak in amplitude how would you describe that phenomenon what other word have you got that identifies that <coughs> it is a natural frequency there's more than that there there's more to it resonant. it's a resonant it's, it's a resonance going on because the system's lightly damped for a relatively small input, you're getting a larger output, but only at that resonant frequency. Okay, so the stuff that you've done in dynamics where you talk about resonant frequencies, that's what we're seeing here, that peak. Okay, and I think Vince would have introduced you to things called transmissibility curves, which are effectively pretty much the same data, but presented a little bit differently. Okay, so that's, that's an underdamped system. What happens to the phase in an underdamped system? Well, again, the green plot, zeta equals 0.1, and you can see what happens there is that the phase change happens very much more quickly. It doesn't take two decades, like the blue one. It almost switches over. It changes over very quickly. Okay, and that's another characteristic of a lightly damped system. <clears throat> okay. The red one, zeta equals 10. I've got quite a heavily damped system. You can see that it's moving further away from where the asymptotes would be. It's, the red one's got sort of cutting the corner a lot more. And the phase shift is taking a lot longer. And in fact, if you look at this, <clears throat> you can begin to identify this happening in two discrete bits. It's almost level in the middle. Then it comes down here. 
on the red one. Okay, and similarly, if you look at the amplitude curve, it's almost as if you got a flat bit in the middle. See if this works. <coughs> Face plot's nearly flat in the middle. Well, that's not much of a straight line approximation, but hopefully you get the idea that that bit in the middle there, again, it looks, it's not curved, is it? And what's causing this is that Again, if you think in terms of, see if I can get rid of the evidence. If you think in terms of factorizing the quadratic for the second order system, if zeta is large and you factorize that thing, what you get is two separate real roots. Okay, so you get two first order systems multiplied together, in other words. <coughs> And whereas when zeta was 1, I said those two first order systems are happening at the same corner frequency. The bigger zeta gets, the bigger the damping ratio, when you factorise that quadratic, what you get is two first order systems at different frequencies, different tor. <clears throat> so if I was to push this further and further with larger and larger zeta, it will look more and more like two separate first order things. Okay, and that's why everything's spreading out. It just comes out of the algebra. Factorize that with large zeta, and you get two real roots, two first order roots, but they're displaced from each other. Okay, zeta equals one, you get two identical real roots. If you make zeta smaller than one, your solutions will be complex when you do the minus b plus or minus the square root of all the rest of it. You'll get a complex solution. But as so long as zeta is bigger than one, that will factorize into two first order things. Okay, so little notes. If we apply the straight line approximations, you'll notice that it doesn't matter what zeta is, <coughs> we end up with the same straight lines. Okay. And that's a bit of a problem because if we've only got the straight lines, we can't tell what zeta is because we've lost that information. Okay. Just looking at the asymptotes, we cannot tell what zeta is. The duration of the phase change also depends on zeta. We, we discussed that. Okay. <coughs> Does that all make sense? It's just taking what we did last time, what we did last week, looking at these bode plots and things, and just looking in a little bit more detail, particularly about the second order ones. The thing to look out for, as I say, is evaluating zeta. Okay? If all we have are straight line approximations, we can't work it out. If we've got the real data, then we can. And we can work it out based on the difference between the real data and the approximations. Is that okay? Yeah? Thankfully somebody's nodding, because that means I can move on to what I really want to talk about this morning, which is to do with stability. <coughs> Cast your minds back a few weeks we were first introduced to feedback systems. Negative feedback systems are represented like that, and we've done enough block diagram algebra to know that we can simplify that, which is, strictly speaking, incorrect, because that should be negative. Should be minus sign on there, to g over 1 plus g times h. Yep, remember that block diagram algebra? And that is our, our classic feedback controller layout, negative feedback controller. <clears throat> in order to inform the debate, and to make a little bit of, of sense of, of why, why this is important, okay, let's, let's think about a real life example here.
Okay, sorry about that. Hinkley Point, nuclear power stations. You know they're, pro they're looking at building another one. Yeah, got a couple of nodding heads. Somebody's up with the news. Um, there are currently two nuclear power stations at Hinkley, A and B, imaginatively titled, and they're looking at perhaps commissioning another one, Hinkley C. So that forward path I'm suggesting to you represents the performance of the nuclear power station, of the nuclear reactor, that they're going to build at Hinkley C. Okay, just by way of example. Okay, so the top bit is a nuclear power station. You guys are now part way through an industrial control module, so you know, you're getting to points where you can develop controllers, so you've made one. And that's what's going to control the nuclear power station. Okay, so th there are two scenarios here, okay? We've got a nuclear power station. You guys have just designed a controller. We could just plug it in, into the loop like that, and press go and walk off for a cup of tea. Okay, version 1A, mind, is this going to work first time? Well, it might do. It might do, it might not do. Okay, so I would be reluctant, to be honest, nothing personal, I'd be reluctant to accept your controller and just plug it into my plant and walk away. I'd, I'd like to know a bit more before I allow it to do that. Okay? Because your controller H is now sitting in my overall transfer function, and that is determining the performance of the system as a whole. <clears throat> and the key question really here is, is there any possibility that my controller H, when you put it into the feedback loop, will turn G times H to be equal to minus 1? Because what happens if G times H is minus 1? What, what does the overall transfer function become? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it becomes infinite, doesn't it? If you, if you think of this, 1 minus 1, anything over naught is infinite. And <coughs> call me old-fashioned, but when it's a nuclear reactor, I don't want an infinite output, because that's probably not helpful. Okay? So simply plugging this in runs the risk that our controller will do something a bit unexpected and produce g times h equals minus 1. So, what I'd like to do is to look at this. Look at g times h and see is there any possibility of that being anywhere near minus 1. Okay. What's another word? for g times h. How do we describe it? Block diagram algebra. What's this one? What's g over 1 plus g times h? Closed loop transfer function. Yeah? So what's g times h? It's worth a guess at that one. Open loop transfer function. Thank you. So. If you look at the definitions for your block diagram stuff for, for the simple GH system, combining it all into one gives us the closed loop transfer function. G times H is defined as the open loop transfer function. In other words, it's what we would get if we opened the loop and took the output from the controller. So we'd have the input R going through G, going through H, and if we study what's coming out of the controller, what we've got there is the open loop transfer function. Okay. So I could look at what the open loop is doing without actually allowing it to control my nuclear reactor. <coughs> so I wanted to see if there's any danger of my open loop system, my g times h, getting anywhere near minus 1. And I think Ben would have discussed the minus 1 th thing with you in the past. So, let's say 
I've done a frequency response test on my open loop system. I've put some sinusoidal demand into my nuclear power station, preferably quite small sinusoids. I don't want to upset it too much. And I've looked at the output from the controller, and, and this is the set of data that is produced. So where's minus one? How does that minus one point translate onto a frequency diagram, onto a Bode plot? Well, we have to split it up into phase and amplitude to go with these pictures, don't we? So what's the amplitude of minus one? How big is minus one? I'm going to wait for this one. How big is minus one? What's the amplitude of minus one? one. Thank you. It's one. So all I need to do is to find a point on my amplitude plot that represents one. In decibels, that's zero dB. So minus one has got something to do with zero decibels. And this plot crosses <coughs> zero dB round about there. Okay, so that point on the amplitude plot just there represents an amplitude of one. So where does the minus sign come in? The minus sign has to come in to do with the phase, doesn't it? And 180 degrees of phase shift, if you think about the shape of a sinusoid, 180 degrees of phase shift is the equivalent to a minus one. It's, it gives us that negative sign. So my plot down here, there's 180. That point there is, is the other part of minus one. It's the minus sign. Okay, 180 degrees of phase shift. So, what I need to do then is say, well, how close is this system really to hitting minus one? And it's, it, we've got to interpret the graphs a little bit, really. So, well, when the amplitude is one, zero decibels, have I got my minus sign established yet? Well, no, I haven't, because when the amplitude is one, my phase shift is somewhere around 120 degrees got a minus 120 in fact so that doesn't achieve minus one because I haven't got the minus fully established let's look at it the other way when I do have the minus established minus 180 phase shift have I got an amplitude of one well no I haven't so, so this is actually quite a promising open loop frequency response because it doesn't go near minus one. Okay. What would be nice is to get some, some feel or some degree of measurement of, well, how close am I to minus one? And to do that, we will define two margins. Okay, there's the gain margin and the phase margin. The gain margin is a question of, well, how much extra gain can I put into this system to make it just unstable? Okay, so can we put in more decibels worth of gain until the amplitude ratio becomes one at that frequency where we've already got the minus sign, at minus 180? And that's the gain margin. The phase margin, look at it the other way, when the amplitude is one, how much more phase lag can I put in to bring this to minus 180? So there we go. If you look at the left hand one, we're picking up on where the amplitude is one and saying, well, I've got that much space left to put in additional phase lag. So that gives me the phase margin. The right hand one, I've already got the phase lag. 
how much extra gain can I put in to reach zero decibels? And that is the gain margin. If either of those numbers is zero or negative, you're in trouble. Okay, if those numbers are both positive, we've got a system that would be stable in the closed loop. We could plug in your controller at Hinkley and everything would be fine. Okay, so these margins are actually very important things to understand. The smaller they get, the more oscillatory your system becomes. And then when they reach zero, you fall into instability. Okay. So the phase margin and the gain margin are very useful numbers that if we've got an open loop test, we can predict closed loop performance. Are we okay on that? Yeah. So we can do an open loop test without trusting our brand new controller to, to actually control the nuclear power plant or whatever it is. And by studying the open loop behavior, we can make predictions about how the closed loop system will behave. We can do the same thing on a Nyquist diagram. Okay. We tend to focus more on boat plots, but nonetheless, on the Nyquist diagram, you can identify the same minus one point and see, well, where does my open loop frequency response data, as I got increasing frequency, where is it relative to that minus one point? If the minus one point is to your left as you travel in an increasing frequency direction, all is well. That's the crude rule. If it's to your left-hand side, you're okay. If it's to your right-hand side, you're in trouble. And if you run over the top of it, you're just about in trouble. How do we measure the ratios? Well, the phase margin is easy to measure on the Nyquist diagram. You would simply draw a circle of radius one and see at what angle the data intersects that circle. And that will give us the phase margin, how much extra lag can we put in, shown in red on there. And similarly, to work out the amplitude ratio, oh, sorry, the, the, the gain margin, beg your pardon, if we look at the amplitude ratio to the point when the plot crosses that axis, that negative real axis, okay? And if that's the amplitude ratio, then the margin is one over that. It's a reciprocal of the actual amplitude. Okay, so we can get exactly that same in quality information from the Nyquist diagram. OK, so we can identify system stability. We can do an open loop frequency response test. And based on open loop information, we can predict performance in a closed loop. OK, that's my system. That's my standard layout for a negative feedback closed loop control layout. Okay. If we study the open loop performance, okay, we can determine then if it's safe to allow that controller to take charge. Okay. We study the open loop performance and then we can take a decision to connect it back up. And that gives us the combined performance. <coughs> okay. And that is much, much easier and much more cost effective than just designing a controller and immediately putting it into service. 
okay, because that can be a high risk sort of proposition. I presented the case of a nuclear reactor controller, which is, you know, it's quite easy to imagine a bad result from that if you get it wrong. But it's the same in all sorts of things. So we study the open loop performance, and from that test we determine the, the gain margin, the phase margin, and knowledge of those two will allow us to predict what happens when we close the loop to produce this. Yeah, is that okay? So, we can identify systems, we can judge from the gain and phase margins how close they are to instability, and assuming we've got positive numbers for both of those, we can actually then predict the type of response we get in the closed loop. Small margins, more oscillation, sums it up. Is that okay? That's a short one today. I want to stop there, just, just leave that. So the first, first five minutes of the today was really talking about second order systems and what's the relationship between the full data set and the straight line approximations. That's just to top up what we did last week. But the key thing now is we, we've now got the frequency response data and we can use it as a tool. We can use it as a tool to predict behavior. Okay, so it's getting more useful, this thing. Last week, we could use the data to identify transfer functions, where we can't actually produce a mathematical model. This week, we can also use that same data to predict performance in the closed loop. Okay, so all this frequency response stuff is actually starting to get quite useful. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it there in terms of new material today. Um, I'm probably preaching to the converted because you guys are all here. Um, but it has become quite apparent that some of the tutorial groups are very poorly attended. Okay. Um, as I say, the fact that you people are here probably means you attend anyhow. Just be aware that we're taking... I've, I've asked the module team to take registers in all the tutorial sessions now. Um, and I will be monitoring who isn't turning up and I will be getting in touch with them. So if you know any of your colleagues that are electing not to go to those sessions, let them know. Okay. Right, I'm going to stop early. Let's, let's just stop there. Thank you. <laughs>